Scooby Dooby Doo. Scooby Dooby Doo. Euro is a waste, and so are US dollars, and it's all fraud. Yeah, this is the Kaiser Report. Well, we don't have to write this show, it just writes itself. These guys just, you know, commit fraud on an hourly basis. We just sit back and tell y'all about it. Great fun, Stacey Herbert. Max, in fact, it's a global bank heist going on, and you can see that in the tweets. Here's the first one from Reuters Business. Bank of England injects $78 billion of monetary stimulus. And here's a tweet from the AP a few moments later. European Central Bank cuts main interest rate by a quarter point to a record low of 0.75%. That's right, low rates, low rates. We've been talking about this for years because speculators want low rates to fund their speculative bets and squeeze out the entrepreneurs, squeeze out the savers, squeeze out wages, keep rates really low. The LIBOR scandal is about keeping rates low by manipulating rates. Quantitative easing is about keeping rates low by engaging in radical central bank policies like Operation Twist. ECB lowering rates is about central bank collusion with other banks to keep rates near zero, to fund speculation, to squeeze out population of workers and savers. Well, Max, in fact, it's a bank robbery, I think, and they're p the bank robbers are posing as speculators in some situations. But I'm going to uh, compare this to one of the most famous bank robbers in American history, William Willie Sutton. He was born in 1901 and died in 1980. He was a profligate U.S. bank robber. During his 40-year criminal career, he stole an estimated $2 million from 100 banks. And he's known for the urban legend that he said that the, he robbed banks because that's where the money is. Today, you don't rob banks unless you're an idiot. You rob the central banks because that's where the credit is. And you rob it through, now, Willie Sutton was famous for using a Tommy gun, a Thompson machine gun. Today, the modern equivalent is derivatives. There are at least 800 trillion, perhaps 1.2 quadrillion, even more, that are used in order to hold up the central banks of the world and tell them, give us all your credit now. Yeah, high frequency trading is the Tommy gun of this era used to rob banks. <laughs> There's Jamie Dimon and his Tommy gun. Or Lloyd Blankfein over J Goldman Sachs and his Tommy gun. Is it robber barons on high frequency trading? I mean, if the robber barons were alive today, they'd be high frequency trading. Lloyd Blankfein is a robber baron in high frequency trading. Well, and for further evidence of this assertion of mine that they are robbing the global central banks of the credit available, whatever credit remains in the system, uh, you know, Willie Sutton said he robbed banks with a Tommy gun because you can't rob a bank on charm and personality. So we're going to go to a charmless guy without personality, Bob Diamond. MPs admit they let Diamond slip away ahead of inquiry vote. So several members of the Commons Treasury Select Committee have admitted that the banking chief was able to get away with evasive and implausible answers during a three-hour appearance before them yesterday. He appeared unable to provide straight answers. He repeatedly strayed off topic and at times appeared unable to understand simple questions. This is his posing as a bimbo. Oh, I don't know, nothing. Ooh, young man over there guarding the safe. Uh, can you help me? I dropped my little bag here. And he bends over and shows his tush to the, the MPs and they open the, the, literally the following day, the Bank of England said, here's 50 billion euros. Yeah, I, I'm exactly right. The Bank of England followed up with Bob's larceny, Bob Diamond's larceny, by another 50 billion pounds in stimulus. Remember when uh, long-term capital management in America got caught stealing? Uh, Alan Greenspan lowered interest rates. But I, I, I lost a little bit of Bob Diamond in front of that in inquiry, and it was like a weasel all vaselined up. You know, and the guys questioning him, they were kind of trying to grab this weasel that had slathered himself in Vaseline. And, you know, oh, he squishes out that, oh, he squishes out that way. I guess that comes in handy when he's down on Old Compton Street later, but what else you got? So let's look at everybody else. Let's look at the ways that people around the world, nations around the world, are trying to fight back against these bank robbers, these bimbo bank robbers. France sees public investment bank by year end. Arnaud Montbourg 
France's Minister for Productive Recovery said a public investment bank will be created by the end of the year. Private banks, he said, are not sufficiently interested in the real economy, preferring to be active in global markets and the confusion between the role of savings banks and investment banks that has many adverse effects. He concluded that it's absurd that banks post indecent margins at the cost of crushing our industrial economy and setting profit margins at 15 percent enters the realm of unscrupulousness and indecency. Yeah, well, France is leading the way on this idea of a new category of law for financial indecency, uh, for financial pornography, to try to apply some negative stigma to these guys who commit these frauds. Bob Diamond should be ashamed to show his face for the financial indecency that he's been involved with, the same way that anyone who's caught you know, surfing for pornography on the web or, or child pornography on the web would be, you know, not want to show their face. In America, when somebody is caught, you know, having this type of uh, law breaking going on, they have to tell their neighbors that they are involved in uh, this program where they're not allowed to be within two miles of a, a school of children. Bob Diamond should be required to tell his neighbors that he was caught stealing money, essentially, and that nobody should get anywhere near him with a wallet or a billfold or a checking account because he has a propensity to steal it from you. Okay, but as Willie Sutton, the legend goes, said that he robbed the banks because that's where the money is. So even if you create a public bank that is supposed to just help your domestic economy, to help your domestic small and medium-sized enterprises, well, there is already a bank like this, and that's in Germany, KFW Bank. Now, here's a headline from September 2008. Uproar over German bank's payout to Lehman Brothers. Yes, as the rest of the financial community was scrambling to get his money out, a government-owned German lender, KFW, gave Lehman Brothers what might be called a parting shot in the arm, transferring 300 million euros to the investment bank on the same day that it filed for bankruptcy. It was a currency swap, Max. Uh, it ended up becoming a one-sided deal because, of course, Lehman Brothers went broke and wasn't able to transfer back to them the $500 million that was supposed to be in exchange for this 300 million euros. <laughs> My KFW bank, German bank, public bank was swindled. Uh, out of this huge multi-billion dollar Lehman collapse nightmare, and the people of Germany have had to pay for that. The people of Germany should be more concerned about KFW Bank than any, uh, you know, subsidies that may or may not be going the way of Greece. But again, like I'm saying, if a bank has money, a central bank has credit. They use this. This is where the credit and the money is. So that's where bank robbers go. It's not accidental. It doesn't matter how much security you put in front of the bank. They're going to try to steal and rob it. So even if they have to pose as the bank's CEO, in this case, Ulrich Schroeder, was the new CEO of KFW Bank, brought in only two weeks before authorizing this transfer to Lehman Brothers, and he called it an accidental transfer. Oh, wow, it sounds like the JP Morgan situation where that $2 billion was accidentally taken out of the MF Global accounts. Oops. Yeah, so again, you know, in the headline on Bill, the biggest magazine in Germany read, Germany's dumbest bank, KFW. Again, the bimbo route, the bimbo disguise. Yeah, well, I got, listening to you, I got this idea of maybe get Americans to save more by creating the KFC Bank. So they think it's Kentucky Fried Chicken. And when they go in there to gorge themselves on fried chicken and mashed potatoes, you charge them 5 or 10% put into a savings bank. And so, you know, as I said, Willie Sutton said he never robbed a bank when a woman screamed or a baby cried. So at least he had some integrity. He, there was a limit to who he wouldn't kill. He wouldn't maim. He wouldn't hurt a woman. He wouldn't hurt a little baby. But these bank robbers of today, Max, they have no scruples like this. They don't care. They'll pull out their Tommy gun, high frequency trading, their, their credit default swaps, their derivatives that are going to blow up your economy, destroy your economy. They're going to take the IMF as the supranational unelected organization that's going to force these debts onto your economy. And that brings us, Max, to the Irish crash, worst since Great Depression. Of course, Willie Sutton was active during the Great Depression days. Ireland's bank crash is the most expensive and deepest of any economy since the Great Depression, says a new IMF report. The fund said that Ireland is the only country to suffer from fiscal costs, increases in public debt, and output losses due to a banking crisis. And it said there is no sign of conclusion in the debt crisis. This came out during the the LIBOR scandal, so nobody really paid attention to this. But here's a, an economy that what that is in a crisis due to an outright bank robbery. Yeah, Anglo-Irish.
You know, they uh, stole the country's fortunes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they still pay off Anglo-Irish because you're right, when the entire population has their money stolen, not just a few people, but men, women, children, everybody, that's a financial genocide. Go to The Hague for crimes against humanity and, you know, take it up on a human rights issue. Well, Max, again, let's talk about that more specifically because I'm talking about bank robbery. So you said that uh, the Irish people are having to pay the Anglo-Irish unsecured bondholders. Why? Because of the Tommy gun of derivatives, right? That, that, that's right. They're using the weapon of high frequency derivatives to steal uh, on behalf of the robber barons and the people live in a state of terror. They live in a, terror, a terrorized state. That's correct. They've had their wealth stolen and this is not stopping. As a matter of fact, the central banks are aiding and abetting by making the cost of ammunition cheaper. The ammunition, of course, is 0% interest rates that fuel the high-frequency trading because in order to put on a few billion dollars of high-frequency trades on any given moment, it costs the margin, but if the margin is near zero, then your cost of ammunition is zero. If you make a mistake, then the state bails you out, then that's a subsidy from the state. So you, make, you have no risk. You simply take a pilfering of all money with no risk, no risk. But that's what I'm saying is that it used to be in Willie Sutton's day in the first Great Depression that you went and robbed a bank because that's where the money is. Now these guys today, the Anglo-Irish guys, the bondholders behind that, the bondholders behind AIG, MF Global, all the world, they're going, they're robbing the credit because it's not cash anymore that they seek. They don't go looking for a pile of cash. Jamie Dimon's not looking to hold up a, a simple little bank for a pile of cash. He freaking runs a bank. It's easy to do that. You're holding up the central banks, the, the credit of the world. Right. You're, you're, you're enabling the transfer of wealth from the many to the few by using stolen credit that ends up back in the economy by sky high prices for Van Goghs and Chateaus and um, other very expensive baubles that end up sitting in the accounts of the top 1% of the top 1% without circulating at all. That's all financed by robbing the banks in the form of using high frequency derivatives to expand one's credit, credit footprint. You see, the Tommy gun of our age, the high frequency credit gun. Oh. Or as Felix the Cat might say, I'll get him with my credit gun. <laughs> did you ever watch Felix the Cat? No. You never did? He had all these crazy guns, like the rope gun. And Minute Mouse, great show. <laughs> all right, Stacey Herbert, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. Don't go away. Much more coming your way. Stay right there. <laughs> Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Let's go to Switzerland and talk with Ellen Brown. She's the author of Web of Debt. Ellen Brown, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Thanks, Max. Ellen Brown, your latest piece is called Government by the Banks, for the Banks, the ESM coup d'etat in Europe. In it, you write that the European Stability Mechanism, the ESM, is actually a permanent welfare fund for the rich. What is the ESM and how does it favor the rich? The ESM is a fund replacing certain temporary funds that were supposedly designed to bail out the uh, Eurozone countries. And the funds are paid for by the various countries, so they're paid for by the taxpayers. But the permanent fund was um, voted in in January in the dead of night, and it has no ceiling. It starts out at 700 billion euros, but it can be raised. There's, there are no limits on it. You can't sue the people who are running the fund. So they're pretty much... Um, dictators of this fund, and now in June on June 29th, there was an EU summit where the members voted. Uh, it was also in the dead of night, and there was a, a ruckus raised by the prime ministers of Italy and Spain, where they said that they were going to block everything that they were doing there if uh, it wasn't agreed that this money could be used directly to bail out banks. It would go directly to private banks rather than being funded first through the governments, which would then bail out their banks. Um, and also they wanted, basically they wanted easier terms for getting the bailout money, but one of the terms was that we go right to these banks. So it's now a bailout fund for the banks, uh, paid for by the taxpayers with no limit. It's rather like the TARP money that the 
U.S. agreed to in Congress, but the TARP only had, it was $700 billion, U.S. dollars, same number, interestingly, but it was had a limit on it. I mean, they didn't do another TARP where they uh, increased the money, and any money after that came from the Federal Reserve, which, of course, just created, created the money on its books. But in this case, it's going to be taxpayer money paying for the banks. Right. Well, after the TARP, uh, money in 2008, Mayor Bloomberg did a FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, and discovered that in addition to the $700 billion that Hank Paulson got for his friends on Wall Street, he also got $16, $17 trillion, uh, for his friends on Wall Street and also the banks in Europe. Now, this ESM is basically what we've been saying now for a while in that the, uh, the willingness to adhere to generally accepted accounting principles anywhere in the world is now out the window. The solution always is to simply create a new funding vehicle to roll up, resecuritize, uh, create a bigger debt burden on the same diminishing level of collateral and make up the difference through austerity measures. So this is just another one of those tricks, right? Exactly, and they've got a limited amount of euros. They're, the ECB is not letting more euros into the system, unless, of course, they lend it to, I mean, they did do a trillion dollars recently in, or a trillion euros in loans to the banks, but these were 1% loans to the banks, which would then lend them to the, to the government. So Greece, meanwhile, was borrowing at 30%, but the, there's a limit on the amount of euros in the system. And then out of that, you have to keep finding interest to pay on these debts. So it's, they're all in debt to each other. And they're all, all these debts are at interest. So you either need to expand the system or somebody goes into default or you, they're going to have to break up the whole system. Right. So it's a classic Ponzi scheme. Yeah. You need you need more suckers to come into the scheme in order to pay the interest on the existing suckers. Uh, let's talk about Mario Monti for a second. He's, of course, a former Goldman Sachs banker. And I see that the, the front page, the cover of the UK edition of The Economist recently featured banksters. So that finally there's a, an acceptance now that the system is run by a criminal syndicate. There's no more um, uh, pretending anymore, so people understand that. But Mario Monti is a bankster from Goldman Sachs. What decisions has he taken on behalf of his population? How do you see that going, Ellen Brown? Well, he's not only um, from Goldman Sachs, but he's also uh, one of the leaders of the Bilderbergers and one of the leaders of the Trilateral Commission. So he's got other motives going on here. And it was, he was the, he's the prime minister of Italy who obstructed what the EU summit was trying to do and said that if they didn't agree to bail out the banks directly, that they were going to block everything. So, so he's obviously working for the banks here and that the whole trilateral, the whole thrust of the Bilderbergers and the Trilateral Commission is basically one world government, one world currency. And the only way you're going to get that they say in their various literature is that you have to have some sort of crisis, you know, an external external threat in order to get everybody to agree to this. Well, the external threat in this case is a, a huge debt that's blamed on governments spending too much money. But in fact, the governments were doing fine until the banking crisis. So it's actually the bankers who are responsible. Okay, let's talk about that for a second, because the ESM, is this new pan-European lending facility, a pseudo-bank lending facility, and it's removing sovereignty from the underlying countries. Over at the uh, Federal Reserve Bank, we find that there's a great appetite to do currency swaps with European banks, and there's a tremendous communication going on there. In the Bank of England, we find out that they're in bed with Barclays Bank and interest rate manipulation. So correct me if I'm wrong, but are we heading to, as a next step in this global centralization of fiat money, fractional reserve mayhem, the European Union, the United States and the UK deciding that they create a new lending facility, give it a new acronym, that they resecuritize all this debt yet again, they give it near 0% interest rate, and it's all going to be managed once again, more centralized as we head toward, as you point out, some kind of global currency, global Fed, global reserve bank. Is that the next step? That 
appears to be the goal of the Bilderbergers and the Trilateral Commission, but I don't, I mean, there's, I don't think they can pull it off. They're not going to hold the EU together at the rate they're going. So, I mean, I think it's the EU, the e Eurozone deal is, is a clear demonstration that it doesn't work. You can't have a single currency, single central bank for governments that are not part of the same government. You don't, what you would need is a single political government to go along with it so you can make decisions for the whole community like you have in the United States. Like if Louisiana has a flood, the rest of us don't mind forking over some money to help Louisiana out because we consider them us. But you don't have that in the Eurozone. Right, but the market certainly doesn't reflect that discord. Europe is still, the Euro, still strong. Uh, still trading r very strong compared to the where it came out initially. So the market itself, the market players are not discounting this kind of breakup scenario. The key player in all this is Germany. Now there's speculation that instead of a Greece exit, that maybe Germany will exit. Of course, there's a lot of pluses and minuses with that scenario. What do you think, Alan Brown? Or they might split up into two, the northern, the northern euro and the southern euro. But... It look, to me, the only thing that actually will work, I mean, Greece, they all need to actually issue their own currencies. They could, they could have two things. They could have the euro as the trading currency, like the reserve currency among all the eurozone countries, and then they could keep their local currencies for their local business. And that way they could fund all these, all these things that they've had to shut down education and public transport and all the austerity measures they're taking you could ha keep those going if you had if you used your own local currency for that and they um, i mean we see that happening all over the world where community currencies local currencies uh trade trade deals where they where they engage in um barter but on a very large international scale that's all happening. At, like there's, there are these secondary money systems developing, and it seems to me that's the only way it can work. Right, and concurrently with all these local communities developing their own currency, there is also a global acceptance around the world for using gold and silver in, in a monetized role in its traditional role as a currency. Now let's look back to the global financial crisis, the history since 2008. You've been keeping close tabs on this. Bear Stearns collapsed. And J.P. Morgan swooped in and was essentially gifted Bear Stearns assets. In retrospect, any comments on this? Well, who gifted them was uh, the New York Federal Reserve. And Jamie, Jamie Dimon then and now sat on the board of the New York Federal Reserve while he was also holding uh, $3 million in stocks and options in J.P. Morgan. So it was a clear conflict of interest. But the thing is, there's nobody apparently powerful enough to execute the legislation that would make that a felony. So the New York Federal Reserve lent J.P. Morgan and Bear Stearns collectively $55 billion in order to bail out, in order to buy Bear Stearns for pennies on the dollar. And uh, what backed it all was Bear Stearns' own collateral. So if Bear Stearns had that much collateral, they should have been able to get the loan themselves and they wouldn't have had to sell out to J.P. Morgan. So J.P. Morgan got a clear windfall on that, and one wonders why. I mean, J.P. Morgan obviously has something going on. It is suspected that it has to do with these interest rate swaps that are propping up the U.S., keeping the U.S. interest rate very low. Okay, finally, Ellen Brown, uh, as countries around the world lose their sovereignty over bad debts of private banks, uh, what do you think about France's announcement that they are to establish a public bank by the end of this year? What is a public bank? Uh, how does it help? And this is really what you've been talking about for a number of years. Talk a little bit about France's uh, decision to introduce a public bank. Yeah, well, this is a public development bank. There, there are two types of public banks. There are the local ones, the municipal banks, like in Germany, that have that funded all these export businesses that put Germany up to the number one exporter until recently. And then there are the federal level type public banks, and those are the development banks. Um, I think probably the best model would be um, in Brazil, where the BNDES is the biggest bank in Brazil. It's this, it was used by President Lula to fund every sort of development program that came along looking for funding. In the 1990s, Brazil was the, the world's largest debtor, 
And 10 years later, they were making loans to the IMF. They were a big creditor. And in fact, Lula said that in an interview. He said, don't you think it's very chic that we are now making, we are now lending to the IMF? And how did they do that? How did he turn it around? He used this big development bank to basically recycle investor money. I mean, it's private money that buys the bonds, but you're buying you're buying something very safe because it's a government bond. You have all this investment money sitting on the sidelines where people are afraid to invest because they it's too risky. But if you're buying government bonds, that's considered very safe. It's a government bond in a development bank. The development bank then lends the money to businesses that, that need money to, to grow, and that stimulates the economy. I think it's a very good idea for France. Alan Brown, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thanks, Max. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I want to thank my guest, Ellen Brown, author of Web of Debt. If you want to send me an email, please do so at kaiserreport at rttv.ru. Until next time, Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.